Harmony Montgomery was a beautiful five-year-old girl with some special needs. This photograph was taken in 2019. That's the year she vanished, but it wasn't the year people started looking for her. That was 2021, two years later. That simple, tragic fact speaks volumes about Little Harmony's life. She was living with her father, Adam Montgomery, her stepmother, Kayla Montgomery, and her two younger half-brothers. Harmony's mother, Crystal Sori, lost custody when she missed a court date. Crystal wasn't there because she had to appear at the same time in another courthouse for another one of her children. That's when Adam gained full custody, despite being a career criminal with drug problems and money problems. Then after getting evicted, Adam, Kayla, and the three young children ended up living in a car in the winter in New Hampshire. And this is where the story gets even more tragic. Harmony did not really vanish. She died. Prosecutors say she was beaten by Adam after she had accidents while living in that car. Adam says he didn't do it. He just helped cover up the death of Harmony caused by Kayla. So now Adam is on trial as prosecutors try to prove he's a child killer. Tonight, we go in depth into the latest evidence revealed in court and look at the evidence to try to figure out where this little girl is as we continue our investigation into what happened to little Harmony Montgomery. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you for joining us on Closing Arguments. We've been watching the testimony. We've heard from investigators, and the investigation was exhaustive. There have been deals that have been given to witnesses. Yet still as we sit here tonight, Harmony Montgomery is still missing. Now, no one believes she's alive. That seems pretty clear from all the evidence and testimony that we've seen during the trial of her father. But where is she? What happened to what was left of her remains? This hasn't been solved. This question hasn't been answered, and she can't rest in peace. Now, Kayla Montgomery, the star witness for the prosecution here, says that she doesn't know. She doesn't know what happened to Harmony, where her remains were taken. And she says that Adam wanted to make sure that she didn't know because if she ever cooperated, if she was ever interviewed by investigators, he didn't want her to have that piece of information. So nothing she has said has led to the recovery of Harmony's remains. Meanwhile, Adam won't say anything, won't say where, if he knows. And the evidence is pointing that way. Everything we've seen and heard in this trial points to the fact that he's the one that ultimately disposed of what was left of Harmony. But he's holding on to that fact. His lawyer is conceding that he was part of the cover-up, yet for whatever reason, he won't say where Harmony is. Again, she cannot rest in peace. Tonight, what we're going to do on this program is we're going to examine some of the evidence take a look at where it could potentially lead to, where he could have possibly gotten rid of that evidence, which is the remains of Little Harmony, where they could potentially be, where investigators have looked. But before we do all of that, we need to go to Court TV crime and justice correspondent, Matt Johnson, who's joining us live tonight from New Hampshire, where all of this is taking place. Another huge day inside the courtroom, and the headline everywhere is that the state rested. That's right, Vinny. Another dramatic day in this, what has been a dramatic trial so far. So the state rested its case in chief after prosecutors had there up on the stand investigators that were part of the search, the nationwide search for Harmony Montgomery. They were talking about this being one of the most important cases of their entire career. And then the state played a recording, a phone call, a jailhouse call from Adam Montgomery, who said that their search and their time and effort was just a waste of time. 
And Vinny, after that, the state rested its case in chief. The prosecutor's almost like a mic drop moment. Everyone was looking at each other when we're hearing these words coming out of Adam Montgomery's mouth because this is the first time that this jury has heard from him. Because remember when they played the police body camera video, there was no audio. So everyone's looking at each other as he is saying that uh, this is a waste of time and it's his own daughter. Well, two things you take away from that. Number one, he knows the answer to the question where Harmony is. I mean, he's pointing the finger directly at himself in that moment. And for some strange, bizarre reason, is all concerned about how much money they are spending trying to find Harmony. That is like jaw dropping, Matt, because any other parent of a missing child, like they're not worrying about how much is being spent by the state. They just want to find their child, and that's the last thing on his mind. Wow, wow, what a finish to the case for prosecutors. Now, let's get to some more of the testimony before the state rested today. Um, yet another witness, because again, these are people who know Adam Montgomery, another incarcerated witness on the stand today. This was the third that we've seen so far in this trial. So she walks in with shackles. She takes her seat at the witness stand. And this is Rebecca Maines who is testifying about the fact that she said she knew Adam Montgomery back in the day. And she had questions about him and his family. And then he told her that he hated his daughter. Listen to this. Who, if anyone, did he ever say Harmony reminded him of? Her mother. Her mother? Her mother. And did he tell you how that made him feel? Oh. God bless you. He said he hated her. Right to his core. Ms. Means, you stated a moment ago that the defendant indicated or said to you um, that he hated Harmony's mother. Is that correct? No. Oh, who did he hate? Harmony. He hated Harmony. Yes. Did he say why? She reminded him of her mother. Her mother being Crystal Sori, as you know, and Crystal Sori was not too far from me in the gallery today having to listen to all of that. And a bit emotional, as you can imagine. But she didn't have to face Adam Montgomery because it's day nine of his trial, and he wasn't here yet again. What a crucial witness. What a crucial witness. To, it, it, it takes us to the place of... I don't think it's a, a specific motive, but like how, how could this man harm this girl, this little girl? And this witness filled in that blank for everyone. Okay, she's a little girl. She, re she reminds Adam of her mom, who Adam, I guess, hates. So he hates her because of that, that memory, that, that reminder. He fought for custody. We can't forget that. He fought for custody of this little girl to do what? To hate her? To abuse her? To collect that check from the government? Okay. Star witness for the prosecution is Kayla Montgomery. And my understanding is, is that the defense wants her testimony stricken in this case. Yeah, that was the big shocking details that we learned um we got a preview of last Friday when we were talking, and uh, the defense filed a motion over the weekend, this long holiday weekend. They want Kayla Montgomery, the state star witness testimony, 
thrown out because they say in her prep with her attorney and with the state, her testimony was tainted because of what she heard that the jury was already informed of about the trial so far. And that's what came out in Cross. Take a look at the, this moment. And he also said, were you aware that Adam was conceding that uh, he had um, been involved in the manipulation, well, the abuse of the court's charge? Yes. And the um, falsifying evidence charge? Yes. And you learned this the morning before you testified? Yes. And you learned this because your attorney spoke to you about it? Yes. And you discussed the ways that you would deal with this information? Objection. Overruled. Mm, not really, no. State in their response, Vinny, as you can imagine, they're saying that this is a bunch of nonsense. They say that opening statements isn't even evidence in the case, that they are allowed to talk to a victim, that she's a victim of Adam Montgomery. And uh, the judge, Amy Messer, she's going to rule on it first thing in the morning. That's a big ruling. You know, this is a witness who is in the middle of all of it. A lot of mixed feelings that people have about Kayla Montgomery. But at the end of the day, she is the most important witness in the case who witnessed the actual killing of Harmony Montgomery. And if that is tossed, I don't know what happens to this case. So this is a major, major ruling. And again, we expect that ruling uh, tomorrow morning. Yeah, that'll be first thing in the morning. The jury is required to come back uh, a little bit later than they normally do. Um, the defense, if they choose to put on a case, that'll start at 10. So this ruling will be first. Okay, that's significant. Very, very significant. Make sure folks are tuning in. Uh, Julie Grant will be on top of that. Uh, big, big issue in the case. So you mentioned that. Okay, the, the defense, then it's up to them. Do we know or what do we know about a potential defense case? Because we all know here, and the folks at home know, the defense doesn't have to put on a case. They don't have to prove anything. Uh, but many times when the evidence is sort of overwhelming, you need to do something. What do we know? Well, uh, it'll be a wait and see game in the morning to see if Adam Montgomery is going to even show up to court so far for nine days of his trial. As we already mentioned, he hasn't been here at the courthouse. He was has refused transport. So that's the big question. Will he take the stand? The judge says that he will waive his right to testify if he doesn't get on that bus tomorrow. That's number one. And whether or not the defense calls any witnesses, here's the stark contrast. So the state had something like 200 witnesses, 191 witnesses on their witness list. The defense only had two. Uh, one is an inmate, Michael Harju, and the other is Michelle Rafferty. Uh, we don't know her connection, Possibly his connection, maybe someone that testified, maybe Adam Montgomery himself, maybe they were incarcerated with him. But the one person that we know will not be called to the stand is Adam Montgomery's father, Michael. And he was listed as number 56 on the state's list. Um, what we know about this is um, I have confirmed that he died over the weekend from a drug overdose. And um, no word yet. If Adam Montgomery has been told this news just yet. Wow. So Adam Montgomery, someone who's been facing addiction and spent a lot of money on drugs, career criminal, father apparently dying over this weekend of a drug overdose. Um, that speaks volumes about everything here as well. Uh, incredibly uh, tragic, but mostly tragic for Harmony. I mean, even... Another generation of her family, her grandfather, having uh, problems with drugs. Adam Montgomery may not show up in court, right, tomorrow. So we're not going to have that moment that we see in every, every trial when the defendant stands up and the judge has to put on the record, you know you have the right to testify. Um, you know, you don't have to testify, but it's your choice and your choice only. 
I mean, it's such an important moment in the, in the trial when the defendant chooses to or chooses to not take the stand. But if he chooses to not even show up to court, we're, we're, that moment's not going to happen. It won't, and we were expecting, if he didn't show up for court, that there would be a colloquy via video because that's what we saw before opening statements when his attorneys um, said that they weren't going to contest a couple of the charges. Um, but now Judge Amy Messer is saying if you don't get on the bus, that's you waiving the right to testify. So it'll be very interesting tomorrow. Uh, we'll know right away whether or not he plans to. Yeah, and judges are always concerned uh, about two things. They, they want a, a fair trial, they want an efficient trial, um, and they want to make sure the thing doesn't get appealed if there's a, a guilty verdict in a criminal case. So the judge really has to be very careful here, and, and I know the judge will be, in dotting the I's and crossing the T's to make sure that if he gets convicted, he doesn't come back and say, well, I didn't have a chance to go to court. I wasn't there. I didn't have a chance to testify. The judge didn't tell, you know, all of that. I'm sure will be part of any appeal if it happens, if he's convicted. All right. Matt Johnson in New Hampshire tonight. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for uh, your continuing coverage of this case, uh, putting us inside that courtroom. We thank you so much. All right, folks, when we come back, um, where is Harmony? We're going to take a look at some of the evidence and the testimony and try to piece together um, where she could possibly be. We'll bring in our experts. Plus, coming up next hour. In Park City, Utah, judgment day for mom fluencer and YouTube star Ruby Frankie as she gets sentenced for abusing her own children. I have broken hearts and I've caused people to suffer and I have betrayed sacred trust. famous actor in a movie set accident that ended in tragedy. I turn and hop the gun, the gun goes off. Now, Alec Baldwin and the film's armorer have both been charged with involuntary manslaughter. Just because it's an accident doesn't mean that it's not criminal. Court TV takes you inside the courtroom as Hannah Gutierrez faces a jury. The Baldwin movie shooting trial. Live coverage this week following jury selection. Only on Court TV. Back in March of, specifically March 3rd of 2020, did you agree to rent a U-Haul van for Travis Beach? Yes. If I could direct your attention to the screen just for a minute, I want to be able to put both the out time and the back time, the out odometer and the back odometer up there for when this van got dispatched out. And just to confirm with the jury, this is the van that you rented. Is that correct? Correct. So, let's see, that's 19 hours, 57 minutes for a rental, and what, approximately 5,225 minus 5,082, around 133 miles or so, give Correct. or take? Yeah, I would say so. Okay, is this U-Haul van the key to what happened to Harmony Montgomery? That was Brendan Middleton. He rented it for Travis and Brittany, two friends of Adam Montgomery, who brought it to that Econo Lodge, okay? Now, let's take a look, because you have to do a little bit of math here to try to get some idea of where this U-Haul may have gone with Adam Montgomery behind the wheel. So we begin here, map number one. The drive from the U-Haul rental uh, to the Manchester Econo Lodge, where Adam Montgomery apparently picked it up, is only 1.8 miles, okay? 1.8 miles. It's close. Not too far away. So let's take a look at, at, at the, the calculation now. So the return mileage of the U-Haul was 5,225 miles. The pickup mileage was 5,092. You do a little subtraction there, um, and you get 133 miles. Then you subtract the 1.8 miles from uh, the U-Haul to the Econo Lodge, and you have about 131.2 miles or so, right? You divide that in half, right? Because you've, when you're driving somewhere, you've got to come back. So, again, this is uh, doing a little bit of rough estimating here. So, 131.2 divided by 2, 65.6 miles one way. So is that how far from the Econo Lodge 
that Adam Montgomery went, or as far as he could have potentially gone. Let's take a look at where that puts us. There's the Econo Lodge, and there, folks, is our 65-mile radius from there. That's where we start, but we have a little more information, so we can get a little more specific here, because there are toll photos of the U-Haul. The U-Haul makes three toll violations on the Tobin Bridge in Boston, Massachusetts. They've got the pictures of them. But the timing of it all is fascinating as well. You've got at 4.44 a.m., Tobin Bridge North, one violation. 4.45 a.m., a Tobin Bridge South violation. And then you've got to push, it, push ahead um, 25, 35, 40 minutes. You've got a Tobin Bridge North violation, again, another North violation, at 5.25 a.m. Now, let's get back to the map. How far is this Tobin Bridge from that Econo Lodge? There you see you're traveling south. It's 53 and a half miles. So now, let's go back and do a little more math, if we can. I hope you're following this, folks, because I can follow this. Again, the return mileage minus the pickup mileage is 133 miles. Um, minus the 1.8 is 131 miles. Divided by 2 is 65.6 uh, miles. Uh, but now you've got to subtract the 53.5 miles to get to the Tobin Bridge, which leaves us with 12.1 miles that are left. So let's take a look at another map. You've got the Tobin Bridge. And this is everything that is within um, six and uh, about six miles around the Tobin Bridge. You've got this area here, and it includes a lot of things if you look at it. A lot of areas. Is this the key? Is this the key to unlocking where Harmony Montgomery may have been disposed of by Adam Montgomery? Let's bring in our guests. Joining us tonight from Boston, Massachusetts, Boston 25 reporter Bob Ward is with us. Also joining us, retired First Justice of the Worcester County Juvenile Court in Massachusetts and the author of the book about Harmony's case. It's called A Cruel Injustice, How Massachusetts Put a Four-Year-Old Harmony in the Hands of a Monster. Judge Carol Erskine is with us. And in Salt Lake City, Utah, retired police commander and host of the Profiling Evil podcast and the author of Deceived, Mike King is with us. Okay. Put a lot of things together there. Bob Ward, first question to you, though. Um, I'm trying to get, trying to understand this, how there could be three toll violations on the Tobin Bridge yeah. and what it means. Uh, what, are, what are you drawing from all of that? Uh, and, and describe for us this Tobin Bridge. Yeah, the Tobin Bridge is the bridge that connects Boston with Chelsea. It's about two miles long, and it goes over the Mystic River. It's the it's a it's a huge uh, way across that, that 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 area. Thousands of people travel that every single day uh, to and from work uh, into Boston. So, you know, the way I look at it is, we do know that they searched in Revere, which is just north of that area. It's six miles north of the Tobin Bridge. They searched the salt marshes there last year. And the reason that's significant is because Adam Montgomery grew up in Revere, and that's where his grandparents had a place. So he's familiar with that area. And the Revere, Chelsea, Boston area, they're very urban areas. But the area that they search, those salt marshes are remote. Uh, Route 107, which dissects it, which is the area that they were searching. I was out there with them. Uh, there is nothing there. There's nothing you can build on. It's just literally salt marshes and a road that goes out. And on the other side of it is the Atlantic Ocean. So Adam Montgomery is familiar with that area. If that is where he, it makes sense, right, that he would have gone there. It makes sense with the mileage that you just did the math for. If you account six miles 
uh, from the Tobin Bridge up to Revere. Now you're just down, that, that cuts off half of that 12 miles that you're trying to account for. It makes sense that they would look in that area, but it is a pretty large area, Vinny. Um, it's like a needle in a haystack trying to find that CMC bag with the trash bags in it three and a half years later and all the storms that have gone through, all the high tides and low tides, but that is where they searched. And I think it's it's a pretty good idea of wh what could have happened here. Mike King, you know, you try to get inside the mind of, of, of someone like Adam Montgomery and it, it would make sense that you would go somewhere that you are familiar someplace oh yeah i know that i know what i can do i know where we can get rid of this bag i know where we can dispose of this and no one will ever ever find it um what are your thoughts tonight mike on all of this i i think you're hitting the nail on the head Vinny, and that is that a predator is going to pick a place that they think they can go and do whatever it is they're planning on doing, disposing of a body in this particular case, and be able to do it without somebody stumbling across them. And think about how hard that is to get to an area where somebody just doesn't happen to be glumping along on the same dirt road or in that same area that you are. But as Bob was describing that, and especially the fact that this is a marsh covered area, and there are roads going over bodies of water that are constantly moving based on tidal influence. It's a great way to think about why he might select that location. And I, you know, I love maps. And as you put those maps up, it really got my brain going pretty quickly because I did a little computation on my own before we got on. And this is an hour and eight minute drive from where he started to get out to that point. And that van was taken for a whole lot longer than that. So you start thinking not only about all the disorganization that was going on with Montgomery before this day, but all of the disorganization that was probably going along at, on as he was driving and trying to figure out if in fact he was out there to dump a body or pieces of a body, where am I going to do this without somebody picking me up? Now, the areas where law enforcement search for Harmony... Um Route 107, Revere Saugus, Broad Sound Tuna Club, Sales Creek, the Bridge Pizzeria, the marsh on the Saugus side as well. Um, all these areas that were actually searched by law enforcement here. Judge Carol Erskine, I know that you have done a study of all this and have tried to put the pieces together yourself. Um, what are your thoughts tonight about where Harmony could be where her remains could have been disposed of by Adam Montgomery uh, on this drive on this on this night. Yes, I had also done the math as you uh, expertly showed a little while ago, and as Bob pointed out, um, that there's really an indication from law enforcement that he was in the marshy area of of uh, Revere. Um, and as everyone points out, it's very remote. Why would he go there? Um, he, he had lived in that area. But the one thing that no one ever mentions about that area is right on Route 107 at the marsh is the giant wheel abrader incinerator. And so I always thought to myself, I, why ne that was never mentioned as, as part of the search. Uh, he waited three months to dispose of her body and carried it from place to place. He had many opportunities to dispose of it, whether it's the Merrimack River or to bury those remains somewhere. But instead, he drives to Boston, he drives within that six mile radius, and he lands along the marshy area where the giant incinerator dumps ashes into the marsh. And I, I was always worried about that and concerned about that because I've always had the feeling that uh, they're not going to find Harmony's remains. I think in his mind, he, he had to dispose of those remains in a way that no one could find them because he understood if those remains were gonna be found that you know, and he was on trial for murder, that would be different than being on trial for murder without the discovery of a body. Uh, uh, Bob, and in describing these areas, you know, many times there are cases where remains are found years later by someone who happens to be there for whatever reason. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts about these marshy areas? I mean, do people go there? Is there, is there ever a reason uh, for people to be there 
you know, on their own, not searching, but doing something else? Sure, there are a couple of pull-offs off of 107 that people can pull over and they can walk around in the higher ground. Um, so that is that is possible that if he had left her someplace that's a little bit higher where the, the tides don't come in, then he's at risk of being found. But there are plenty of places, there are bridges and things. I was out there when the police were searching that you could, there's a river that goes through there, creeks that go through there, that if he threw the bag into the water there, um, it, it would make, you know, nobody would find it. He would just have to be extraordinarily unlucky for that bag to maybe come back the wrong way. But the tide goes out into the ocean. I think what Judge Erskine mentioned about the incinerator is really interesting. And that is, that is a real possibility. He would have to know how to get something into that incinerator. Was there a dumpster somewhere? And he knew where the dumpster, where that trash was brought to. Um, I was just in court today for Brian Walsh, who's accused of murdering his, his wife, Anna, and her remains ended up in a in an incinerator on the south shore of boston so you know it is very possible that that could have been the fate of this cmc bag all right our guests are staying with us uh, when we come back more on the search for harmony montgomery and we're going to take a look at some of the areas outside of massachusetts that were that were searched by law enforcement and and what if anything um that means in in this search for this missing little girl uh, we did physical searches of uh, many different locations throughout the city. Uh, we did searches of an air, a wooded area on the west side. We did uh, searches of uh, uh, the rivers, uh, riverfront area on the north end of the city. Um, we did searches of Bearbrook State Park, which is, if you're not familiar, just a, about a half an hour north of here. Um, we did searches out of state that I was familiar with. I wasn't directly um, involved in those, um, but several searches throughout the course of a six-month period. The search for Little Harmony Montgomery and also the search for evidence uh, as well. A lot of searches here. This was intense, what law enforcement did, but remember, they were... They were behind by two years because Harmony was gone for two years before these searches began. And that's the tragedy of the story and also the challenge for law enforcement. Let's put up on the screen some of the, the searches in Manchester, New Hampshire uh, that took place. You've got 77 uh, Guilford Street, the house there. You've got the wooded area on the west side of the city behind the Mount Calvary Cemetery. Uh, the north end of the city along the Merrimack River in Stark Park. Bear Brook State Park. 644 Union Street, the apartment there. Also, the Families in Transition Shelter, significant part. There was also a water search uh, near the dam in, in Manchester, New Hampshire. Let's bring back in our guest, Bob Ward, <laughs> Judge Carol Erskine, and, and Mike King. Uh, Bob, these searches, uh, There's a, which of these from your perspective, was the most intense of all the searches? Well, I think the Merrimack River was the uh, most intense because they were in the water looking for her. And the Merrimack River is, a ma is the major river in that section of New England. It's a powerful river. And uh, that dam at one point helped fuel the Industrial Revolution. And I remember when Harmony was missing and we were doing stories and trying to figure out exactly what we're talking about now, where could she be? We went down to the edge of the Merrimack River in Manchester, down below the dam, and I couldn't believe how powerful that that current was of the water as it passed through Manchester. So it made a lot of sense for them to be looking um, on the north end of the dam before it got down to the lower part of the river and also in Stark Park, which isn't all that far away from the Burger King where some of these events took place. So I, that's a, that was a natural place for them to be looking. Uh, Adam Montgomery complained in that, um, that audio that uh, the, the police got a tip that led them there, but it would just be a natural place to try to find what he did with that little girl's body. Mike King, we're talking about water searches here and the state of the remains of Harmony Montgomery. What are your thoughts there about what you're actually looking for in the water at that point? 
I think we have to take into account that if everything we're hearing is true, that there was a process of allowing this child to decompose over several months, even with the idea that maybe there was some freezing during the day and, and not at night, that much of the body fluids that dogs would alert on and other kinds of things are probably gone. And then if we believe the stories about the lie and the attempts to break this body down even further, then we're get, it's getting even tougher, Vinny. And you know, we've talked about cases that I've been able to work on where we've recovered bodies that have been in rivers for even a short amount of time. Finding skeletal remains in the bottom of a marsh or a river is gonna be next to impossible because those bones will settle into the silt and they'll disappear as the currents move things around. So this is such a huge challenge that unless they can find something like a tooth or something they can identify, this this may be a, an exercise of just proving to the public we're not going to stop. Let's take a listen to Douglas Small. This is the um, grandfather of Kelsey Small, who again connected to Adam. This was the girlfriend after he left Kayla. Um, she lived up in Maine. Let's take a listen. Do you own any properties in Carmel, Maine? I do. And can you describe those for the jurors, please? They're just, uh, <clears throat> they're all one family residential homes. Um, do you own any large parcels of land? I have two properties that uh, encompass about 30 acres each. Is there an old schoolhouse on one of those? There is. Um, is there an old outhouse on one of those properties? <laughs> it's uh, the, the old outhouse that you speak of uh, is in the old schoolhouse. It's a one-room school. Mr. Small, with respect to the properties that you own in Maine, are you aware of, of searches that were conducted on those properties? There was one day when uh, a group of detectives, or at least uh, police people, uh, came and, and went through the old schoolhouse. Judge, um, this testimony demonstrates how exhaustive the search has been for, for Little Harmony going up to Maine. You're, you're talking about all these searches in Manchester, down to Massachusetts. Um, how important is it uh, in this case? How significant is it in this case that they have not been able to find her? I think the significance of it is that they're not going to find her. I think that they've done an exhaustive search in, in three different states. But this is Adam Montgomery, who's used to um, manipulating the criminal justice system, of, of thinking exactly uh, how he's going to do things that in, in a way that it is really going to fool people. And I think his his statements in those phone calls from the prison say a lot. You know, he's mocking people. You know, how how do they think they're going to find anything? What a waste of money. This is just, I think, classic of his malevolent personality. And uh, I think what it says and what's really sad is that it's unlikely that they're ever going to find her remains. Bob Ward, you know, inside that courtroom is... Um Harmony's mother, who lost custody. Um, we've gone over how all that happened, but Crystal Sori is in that courtroom um, each day listening to this evidence. And, uh, you know, Bob, I'm wondering from her perspective how important or how huge it would be for her to be able to know that the remains have been found and, and Harmony could rest in peace. I think it is vitally important for Crystal Sori that she knows what happened to her daughter with no questions asked. That's a known fact. I, I, you know, in her heart, she knows what happened. But to, to know uh, exactly what happened, I do a lot of work with victims' families, and they all tell me that what's even more important to them than justice is just having that knowledge that they can bring their loved one home, their loved one who's been missing for, in some cases, decades. 
it means everything to them. And I'm sure it means that way for Crystal Sori, regardless of the outcome of this trial. Big thank you, Bob Ward, Judge Carol Erskine, Mike King as well. Um, your time uh, is so valuable and we appreciate it. Uh, thank you all so much. We'll see you again as we continue our coverage of this story.